Good evening and welcome to the University of Mary Washington. My name is Scott Harris. I'm Executive Director of Museums. Uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here for the James Monroe Museum's Women's History Month lecture, which we're doing in partnership with our colleagues and friends at the Mary Washington House. And I'd like to recognize Michelle Hamilton, manager of the Mary Washington House, to also join in the greeting. Thank you for coming also. This is a, a fun event we do every try every year to try to do a co-event with our friends at J. James Monroe um, Museum. Uh, Mary Washington House is an exciting time as we're starting to, as we have been, researching more into the life of Mary Ball Washington and learning more about her. Currently, the Washington Heritage Museums are in the process of GPR scanning the Montmed Meditation Rock area to see if we can finally locate the burial location of Mary Ball Washington. Um, the process will be going on for most of the spring and we're hoping to have some initial results by May, keeping fingers crossed as long as the weather cooperates. Again, um, we're always welcome to come visit to the Mary Washington House and learn more about this amazing woman who was very much learning how to and challenging the status quo for a woman of her time. Thank you, Michelle. We want to give thanks also to the Friends of the James Monroe Museum, uh, without whose support our public programs would not occur, or at least they wouldn't occur as often. So we're very uh, grateful for that. Our next program, in fact, will be Founding Friends, James Monroe and the Marquis de Lafayette, the French people are going to hear a cheer, um, by our friend Monroe biographer Tim McGrath. And this is part of a lecture series that is uh, uh, one of a number of activities that are gonna commemorate this year the bicentennial of the Marquis de Lafayette's grand tour of the United States in 1824 and 1825. He made a big splash here in Fredericksburg and we're going all out to commemorate that event. That will be at the Central, branch, uh, Central Rappahannock uh, Regional Library branch, the Fredericksburg branch here, 1201 Caroline Street and it will be on April 4th beginning at 6 p.m. So we really wanna encourage people to come out. It's one of a number of lectures that are going to be great. We will have another lecture uh, related to that commemoration in the fall, and we'll talk more about that uh, at a later time, but very happy to be a part of that commemoration. Dr. Jacqueline Beatty is Assistant Professor of History at York College of Pennsylvania, where she teaches courses in early American, women's and gender, and public history. She taught previously at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, as a visiting assistant professor, and at George Mason University, just up the road, as an adjunct instructor and graduate teaching assistant. Dr. Beatty received her PhD in Early American and Women's and Gender History from the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University in December 2016. She earned her MA in United States History and Women's and Gender History from Villanova University in 2012, and a BA in History from Boston College in 2010. She speaks and writes frequently on topics within her fields of study, and her presentation tonight focuses on her latest book, Independence, Women and the Patriarchal State in Revolutionary America. Now before I say please join me in welcoming, there's something I left out. For our Facebook audience watching live, You'll have an opportunity to post questions, and if you'll do that in the chat, uh, we'll have an opportunity to address those. So now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacqueline Beatty. All right, if I'm too loud, somebody just do this to me. I'm not used to having a microphone, and I generally am pretty good at projecting to my students, so if it's gonna hurt your ears, let me know. Um, I'm really happy to be here for a Women's History Month lecture. I know it's not te technically Women's History Month yet, but if it weren't leap year, it would be, so we're just gonna pretend. In a couple hours, it will be Women's History Month, so we're just jumping right in. Um, so I would like to start my talk today by introducing a woman who has, for a long time, been really central in my educational and professional life. Her name was Elizabeth Graham Ferguson. Uh, now you might be wondering how is a woman from the 18th century so central to your professional life? Uh, I started researching um, Elizabeth Graham Ferguson's life my first year as an MA student over a decade ago and have really been captivated by her life ever since. I've written numerous different kinds of papers uh, on Ferguson and she opens up 
the book. Um, so I think her story is very interesting, very compelling, a little bit melodramatic, which is good for a talk, um, but very useful to kind of illustrate the arguments I want to talk about today. Right. Uh, so young Elizabeth Graham lived both in Philadelphia and Horsham, Pennsylvania. Uh, the latter is about uh, a, a rural area about 15 miles from the city, kind of as the crow flies, not with traffic. Uh, she herself came to be known uh, as being among the most learned of 18th century American women uh, and was a poet of some note during her time. Uh, she was well known among elite society for hosting salons in her Graham Park home, fulfilling the domestic role vacated by her mother after Anne's death in 1765. These so-called attic evenings attracted some of Philadelphia's most influential elite, and it was at one of these such events on December 7th, 1771, not yet an infamous date, but kind of infamous for Elizabeth here, uh, that the city's most prominent doctor, Benjamin Rush, brought a young man named Henry Hugh Ferguson to Graham Park. By most accounts, observers noticed an immediate attraction between the two, but Henry, who was a recent Scottish immigrant and a penniless one, 12 years Elizabeth's junior, was perhaps, needless to say, not Thomas Graham's first choice of spouse for his daughter. Uh, nevertheless, Elizabeth and Henry did marry clandestinely in April of 1772, so just several short months later, uh, and the two maintained this secret for months, um, most importantly from her father. Um, on the day in which uh, Elizabeth had finally worked up the courage to tell her father about their nuptials, he suffered a heart attack and died. Uh, <laughs> told you it was melodramatic, uh, while walking the grounds of their Grand Park property. And I always think this story is apocryphal, but there's a lot of source material that verifies it. Uh, she wrote of the incident to a friend, explaining that as she was watching her father walk toward the house from her window, she was ready and resolved. OK. Oh, OK. I'm not loud enough. That's surprising. OK. Um, uh, she wrote of the incident to a friend, explaining that as she watched her father walk toward the house from her window, she resolved to tell him, finally, about her union with Ferguson. But as he got closer, he had fallen to the ground and died before she was ever able to share the news with him. So I share this story uh, not just for the shock value of it, make sure you guys are on your toes, um, but because of the complex legal, political, and marital morass it set in motion for Elizabeth. Right, so in the 18th century, Anglo-American society followed English common law practices. Pertaining to women, Sir William Blackstone wrote in his Commentaries on the Law of England that at the time of her marriage, a woman became what was known as femme covert, or a, co a covered woman, who was, quote, under the protection and influence of her husband. Right, covered. Um, as a result, she was to, quote, depend almost all the legal rights, duties, and disabilities that either of them acquire by the marriage on her husband. Blackstone acknowledged that these disabilities, which the wife lies under, are, for the most part, intended for her protection and benefit. He even went so far as to describe women's legal situation as making them, quote, a favorite of the laws of England, right? Some kind of preferential treatment. This system known as coverture expected women's legal and financial submission to men, and in exchange, a husband was, quote, bound to provide his wife with necessaries by law as much as himself, for he has adopted her and her circumstances together. So women's dependence here is well, uh, their dependent status is well defined under the law, um, but it also permeated Anglo-American society and culture in the revolutionary era in the form of conduct literature, or what we sometimes call prescriptive literature. Pamphlets, novels, magazines, essays, and poems all established separate standards of behavior for women and men, especially in regard to their marital roles. So the good wife, for example, was charged with the task of upholding the solemn contract of marriage by remaining virtuous, constant, and faithful to her husband, chaste, pure, and unblemished in every thought, word, and deed. Easy peasy, right? Uh, she was to be submissive to her husband's authority, and she was to desire and strive to obey him by her own inclination. 
Women, though, were not the only ones called to perform certain standards of comportment in this mutual relationship. Just as wives owed a certain amount of deference to their husband's authority, so too were husbands expected to behave in a certain way. Men were specifically entrusted with the duty of providing financially for their wives, especially in their covered status. Um, and ultimately, women remained legally, economically, socially, and culturally dependent on men. All of these different kind of dynamics and expectations. So all of this is to say that Thomas Graham's death had very real consequences in Elizabeth's life. Upon her marriage to Henry, her clandestine marriage, Elizabeth became femme covert, her independent legal identity subsumed by that of her new husband. Any property or money she stood to inherit, uh, rather substantial in this case, would by default instead belong to her husband. Had Thomas Graham been informed of his daughter's intention, or uh, in reality, her marriage to the young penniless uh, Scott, he could have arranged for legal provisions that would have kept his property from Henry, or at least put aside some of it for Elizabeth to control and inherit independent of her husband. Such marriage settlements were not common in early American history, but were possible and regularly employed by the wealthiest in these societies. The trouble was, of course, that Thomas died before he ever knew about his daughter's marriage. Even worse, as Henry utilized his newfound social prominence, traveling across the Atlantic and spending time in Britain, a war broke out between the crown and its colonies in North America. During his stay in England in 1775, Elizabeth wrote to her husband, advising him to stay, to remain in England amid the violence and turmoil at home, and he did so until 1777. When he did return to the colonies, or to the United States, depending on your political persuasion, he came with Sir William Howe, the commander of the British forces, while declaring his loyal loyalty openly to Great Britain. Right? Philadelphia, at the time, was occupied by British troops, and Elizabeth was already apprehensive about crossing into occupied territory from Horsham to meet them. Henry would also later use Elizabeth as an intermediary sent to implore George Washington, who was then the commander of the Continental Army, to renounce independence and surrender to General Howe, right? Henry is asking Elizabeth to please go speak to General Washington about this. Uh, similarly, Henry and his brother Adam Ferguson attempted to convince Elizabeth to orchestrate a bribery scheme to undermine the Continental Army. Um, and both of these episodes would cause significant political problems for Elizabeth and damage her reputation among the Philadelphia elite. So the British occupation of Philadelphia ended in June of 1778. A few months prior to that, the Confiscation Act gave the revolutionary government of Pennsylvania the power to claim all property from those who maintained their loyalty to the crown. Likewise, offenders could be banished from the state and in certain cases hanged for treason, right? Depends on who's in charge of the government at that time, right? Henry was adjudged to be a traitor in October of 1778. His property, including, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my spot, including that which Elizabeth inherited after her father's death was confiscated by the state of Pennsylvania. Henry had already left Philadelphia with General Howe at this point, um, and he first resided in New York, briefly meeting with his wife in New Jersey in 1779, and almost immediately after this reunion, Henry sailed for Boston, from which point he returned to England. Now, despite several attempts, I will say, on Henry's part to convince his wife to join him in Britain, and on a few occasions, obviously, requests for money, as he was wont to do, Elizabeth never obliged. She remained in Pennsylvania for the rest of her life, and the two never saw each other again. Her marriage effectively, if not legally, ended. Elizabeth sought to regain her family's estate, her inheritance, by petitioning Pennsylvania's revolutionary era state government. For several years, she sought a redress for the crises she experienced, working with her connections in Philadelphia and leaning on friends for financial support and oftentimes for a place to stay. After a years long back and forth with Pennsylvania's Supreme Executive Council, she submitted her plea in 1781. At issue 
was the state of Pennsylvania's impending sale of Graham Park, her late father's property in Horsham. So I'm gonna take a brief break here in Elizabeth's story to talk about the process of petitioning, uh, which is very different from what we're used to today. You know, somebody sends you a link and they wanna get 100 signatures for some kind of fundraising effort. Um, in the context of the 18th century, petitioning was a right of subjects of the British Crown and later of citizens of the United States and an especially potent tool for dependence among uh, uh, these societies. The petition was both a personal and a political outlet that allowed supplicants to request or demand certain things from the state. And it really depends on the tone there, whether it's a request or a demand. Um, the number of petitions uh, rose significantly during times of crisis, as you might expect, including during the American Revolution. Colonists petitioned both the British Empire and their local and revolutionary state governments along with the Continental Congress, right? Uh, the government is very decentralized, so there's lots of avenues, uh, both during and after the conflict. Uh, many scholars have studied these sources and most pay very close attention to the ways in which they provided opportunities for marginalized people like women to enter into the public political sphere. Um, what I have found in my research, however, was that these petitions reveal the inherent and deeply rooted influence of the discourse of dependence on revolutionary era women's lives, right? You read thousands of these, these <laughs> patterns start to stick out, right? Women often filled their petitions with language that reaffirmed their socially and uh, con culturally presumed positions of dependence on men, they emphasized uh, tropes of feminine helplessness and vulnerability, including, for example, financial incompetence, ignorance of the law, dependence on their husbands for money to bolster their cases. While the rhetoric and narratives that permeate these petitions appear kind of reflexive and perhaps a formality, deeper analysis reveals that women made a purposeful choice in how they presented their own stories to the patriarchal state. Thus, petitions can be viewed as an expression of women's agency through the exploitation of their subordinate status in a way that inherently and ironically rejects that status, okay? So in her petition, which coincidentally is also the cover of the book for those of you with eagle eyes, uh, Elizabeth Graham Ferguson claimed that the state's sale of her estate would serve, quote, at once to destroy the sole support of one who, must she repeat it, will not be found to have deserved evil at their hands, right? So she's not pulling her punches there. Elizabeth implored the council to relieve her of her insurmountable burdens and benevolently return Graham Park to her so that she might, quote, make such disposition of it as may be necessary for her future support. In closing, she reached out to the council members' sense of obligation to citizens and particularly legal dependents like women in her situation. She implored them to consider her own innocence in the matter of her husband's behavior and forgive her association with him. Quote, she flatters herself their own feelings will never reproach them for the act and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. As an addendum, Elizabeth included a list of 41 men who could attest both to the legitimacy of her claims uh, and to her position as an object worthy of the council's compassion. Significantly too, evidence suggests that Elizabeth played a critical role in the drafting of the petition. The petition itself, as you can see, is the product of several years of edits and amendments cluttered with strikeouts, crammed with commentary in the margins, all of which supplement and at times contradict the original text. Happily, I found some sources. Uh, a letter from Andrew Robeson, who is an attorney and friend of Elizabeth's in particular, uh, reveal at whose direction the markups were made. Robeson wrote to Elizabeth, assuring her that, quote, Mr. Matlack has been waited on and the alterations made agreeably to your desire, right? Elizabeth's plea, replete with tropes of feminine dependence, was a clear product of her own pen and mind and engaged an artful strategy designed to evoke the sympathy of this legislative body. And the strategy worked. Eventually, Graham Park was returned to Elizabeth's sole ownership, she lived the remainder of her life with a close friend, Eliza Stedman, while publishing some of her poetry in magazines. Uh, eventually, due to financial hardship and declining health, 
she eventually sold the property to her niece's husband in 1795, moved out of Graham Park, and lived close by until her death in February of 1801. And if ever you make it up to Horsham, Pennsylvania, Grand Park is still there. It's a beautiful property. They do a nice tour, so happy to recommend that. Um, I often get asked whether women actually uh, believed what they wrote, whether they bought into the language of their dependence on men. Um, I, too, certainly wondered the same thing while researching and writing the book. Um, I would love to find a source, of uh, perhaps a letter of one of my subjects writing to a dear friend that she had lied to the legislature, right? Uh, you won't believe what I just wrote to these guys kind of source. Uh, unfortunately, I found none of those um, yet. Uh, many of the women I write about were illiterate or left behind few, if any, written records by their own pen or voice. Um, but to a certain extent, it doesn't necessarily matter what they actually believed because what was critical was that these women were making an explicit choice to employ this language, very attuned to what their audience, uh, the patriarchal state, would want to hear. And in most cases, as with Elizabeth, it worked, right? Uh, there were those, of course, who did not employ this language or follow this pattern. Um, a minority of women physicians chose instead to chastise the state or chastise their husbands, uh, in other words, patriarchal uh, figures in their lives, and did not provide the requisite supplicating language of dependent femininity. By and large, those petitions were either rejected outright or kind of ignored and set aside uh, by state officials. So I spend so much time on Elizabeth's story here because I think it really illustrates the complex dimensions of women's dependence and women's power in the revolutionary era that I'd like to break down today. Uh, early American women, like Elizabeth Graham Ferguson, understood the power inherent in their performance of or acquiescence to expectations of feminine comportment. When deployed judiciously, this language convinced men in positions of authority to provide aid, assistance, and especially financial relief to women in distressed situations. Joseph Reed, who was a delegate in the Continental Congress and later president of Pennsylvania, wrote to Elizabeth's friend, Anna Stockton, suggesting that Elizabeth was wise to target the fellow feeling of these elite men in her petition. Quote, as to the lady who is the subject of our concern, I hope she and you will do me the justice to believe I sincerely pity and sympathize with her in the misfortunes which have clouded her prospects and embittered her life. My wishes and intentions ever were to soften her calamities to the utmost of my power. So you can really see the gendered language in his missive there. Uh, further, Reed insisted that Elizabeth should consider herself fortunate that the power and ability to relieve her of her distresses were, quote, lodged in the hands of gentlemen of tenderness and consideration who had a record of showing, quote, the most favorable attention to distress like hers. Elizabeth, in other words, was utilizing the most powerful weapon in her uh, arsenal, right, this petition, uh, to put pen to paper in deploying the most effective language that she could muster. American women in the revolutionary era knew very well the terms of their multifaceted dependencies. Despite truly enormous social, legal, and economic restrictions, however, early American women were far from powerless. How is it then that these women with very few rights under the law and certainly restricted access to the political sphere were able to express power? During and after the revolution, women's petitions to what I refer to as the patriarchal state, which would include the colonial, revolutionary, and early national institutions, organizations, and spaces governed and controlled by elite white men, these petitions increased exponentially. The consequences of the war for American independence provided both the impetus and the opportunity for women to seek intervention from male authorities in their communities and at the state level. In their increased interactions with the patriarchal state, women employed the very terms of their complex and intersectional dependencies as a strategy to exert agency over their own lives. Significantly, too, the American Revolution provided some women with the language and opportunities with which to claim old rights, the rights of dependence, in new ways. So paradoxically here, early American women were able to negotiate and argue for a relative degree of power, independence, and rights 
from the patriarchal state because of and while they existed firmly within this position of dependence. All right, so Elizabeth Graham Ferguson was not the only woman to petition her state government in the revolutionary era. In my research, I identified thousands of petitions focusing specifically on women in the cities of Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston. I expected to see some significant variation among the petitions of women in these three cities due to cultural, regional, social, and economic differences, um, but instead what I found was far more common ground than I anticipated. I looked at primary sources in which women would have been interacting directly with the patriarchal state. So this included legislative petitions like Elizabeth Graham Ferguson's, uh, but also divorce records, marriage settlements, equity cases, probate records, manumission deeds, almshouse books, and charitable institutional files. The language excuse me, the language across these sources significantly was quite similar and mirrored that of conduct literature uh, and common law custom of the time, those kind of two ideas that I introduced at the beginning. What really differed between these three locations was the legal medium through which women sought redress from the government. Uh, in other words, it was the law within each jurisdiction itself that made women's experiences differ, though the rhetorical strategies were quite uniform. Take, for example, laws regarding marital separation that govern the lives of women in these three cities. Massachusetts uh, had allowed for divorce for specific reasons from its founding Puritans believing that marriage was a civil contract and could therefore be dissolved if broken. Uh, Pennsylvania had very limited options for divorce until 1785 when the revolutionary era state governments liberalized the practice and South Carolina did not allow for divorce until at least the reconstruction period uh, and that was you know when they were being occupied by the United States military and as soon as reconstruction ended they went back to not allowing divorce so I like to say that Pennsylvania is usually the Goldilocks in the situation right too hot too cold just right so we have a wide range of uh, legal restrictions facing women in these three cities all right so I looked at divorce suits filed by women in Boston and Philadelphia and found sources somewhat comparable in South Carolina, uh, and those were called femsoul trader deeds, and I'll talk about those more in a minute. Um, because we're here in Virginia, I'd like to talk about what the case of Mary Ball Washington and Eliza Courtright Monroe would be, right? because both of these women would have been subject to the laws of the colony and later state, or sorry, Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm sensitive to that one too, being a Pennsylvanian. So uh, divorce was not a legal possibility in colonial Virginia, and it was not until 1803 that the Virginia General Assembly, Assembly passed the Commonwealth's first act of divorce. Evidently, that measure was quite popular. Uh, the assembly um, had given themselves jurisdiction over these matters, but eventually they transferred that authority over to uh, the chancery courts in 1827, seemingly overwhelmed by the sheer number of petitioners seeking this legal separation. Right. Women in Boston, uh, for example, took seriously the expectations that their marriages were a contractual arrangement. Their petitions to the Suffolk County Court demonstrate as much. Right. Here in Virginia, with a significant Anglican population, marriage was deemed to be a sacrament, not a civil contract. And in the colonial period, uh, and the ecclesiastical courts did not exist in Anglo-America during Mary Ball Washington's lifetime. Um, but Massachusetts wives had much more access to this process because of the kind of legal precedents. Um, they offered up the various ways in which they themselves had held steadfast to their marital covenants, right? Being obedient, submissive wives who acquiesced to their husband's authority, while in return their husbands violated their social, economic, and legal obligations to their dependent spouses. Philadelphia women did not inherit the cultural expectation of marriage being a civil contract, as their counterparts in Boston did, but Pennsylvania's newly expanded uh, 1785 statutes regarding divorce gave women new opportunities for seeking marital separation from, for example, husbands who had deserted them years prior. Like their contemporaries in Boston, though, Philadelphia women also emphasized that they had performed dutifully their subordinated gender roles within their marriages. In these cases, women gained a degree of independence by emphasizing their dependence on men. 
Women in Charleston could not seek such redress within their marriages, but they did have mechanisms for claiming financial independence, that is, a form of femme sole status, right, as opposed to femme covert, um, while still remaining married or femme covert. Um, this was called femme sole trader status, uh, which gave married women the right to conduct business and sign contracts um, in their own name and otherwise to maintain that kind of distinct separate legal identity. The law, of course, required that husbands had to consent to this arrangement, uh, which they did in formal documents submitted to the General Assembly. Oftentimes, these men acquiesced that their wives were better financial providers uh, than they themselves were. Um, and in this way, Charleston women could gain financial independence from husbands, all while remaining dependent on them in other ways. The legal structure was really integral then in framing women's dependence and their ability to express power over their own lives. Laws are, to quote historian Laura Edwards, the aspiration of lawmakers, the vision of the kind of society they want to create, the social order they wish to enforce. But laws are also what people make them. Um, petitions as sources provide clues of women's lived experience when the historical record is otherwise silent. They show us the ways in which women conformed to the law and social custom, but also the ways in which they made the law their own. Rather than seeing the law's power as absolute or rendering women's resistance exceptional, I'd argue that we need to rethink ideas of dependence, power, and the law to recognize the fullness of women's experiences through their exploitation of this confining system. So let me provide another example here. A Bostonian woman, a woman named Free Love Scott, and yes, that is her real name, I didn't make that one up, uh, she was able to successfully manipulate the law to work to her advantage, all while exploiting tropes of feminine dependence in her several petitions to the Massachusetts Assembly. Her husband, a man named Joseph, had left Boston when the British occupation ended in March of 1776. Under Massachusetts Confiscation Act, his property was then under right. Free Love's petition mirrored that of many other women, like Elizabeth Graham Ferguson, um, but in it, Free Love crafted a sympathetic narrative, intent on evoking paternalist sentimentality from the legislative body. She sought the, quote, compassion of your honors, please, for the distresses of an unfortunate mother who has the care of five children without money to support them or the means of procuring it. She predicted that her family, without her husband present, would suffer certain poverty and destitution, asking that she and the children be able to live in their home rent-free until the assembly rectified the unfortunate confiscation of her husband's property. Right here, Free Love was looking to have the assembly bend the law in her favor. Never once did she contest her husband's politics, and instead, she admitted to them, but argued that her children should not be made to, quote, suffer for the faults of their father. Consistently, she distanced herself from her husband's politics and often rebuked them, a really tenuous line for women to toe in the revolutionary era. So temporarily, at least, the body agreed to her request. She paid no rent to remain in her home with her children, at least until the assembly was going to decree any further resolves. Her next petition, however, was a bit more pointed. Uh, with her husband out of the country and she and her children still legally dependent upon, them, upon him, Free Love claimed a certain amount of protection in that dependence, which she believed was owed to her by the state itself, right? Effectively, with her domestic patriarch, her husband, the father of her children, no longer able to provide for them in his absence, she argued that the state itself ought to step in as a surrogate for that role. She repeated that sympathetic narrative, her helpless situation, paying the required lip service to her subordinate role. Yet portions of her petitions, uh, petition was decidedly uh, less deferential, we'll say. Um, Freela wrote that she presumed her situation would have entitled her to such a share of commiseration as to have produced a suitable support for herself and family out of her husband's effects. Here then, she simultaneously asserted her dependence and uses that dependence to make demands of the government, which she believes has failed to fulfill its patriarchal role, just as her husband had implicitly failed to do. Likewise, this second plea was also replete with somewhat subtle accusations about the legislature's lack of sympathy for her plight. 
She accused the assembly, for example, of only granting her 150 pounds in relief funds. Significantly in response, the state offered a unique solution that ran counter to legal precedent at the time. Free Love Scott, the assembly ordered, was to be granted one third of her husband's estate, which is the equivalent of her dower right, what widows uh, get from their late husband's estates when they pass away, right? So what the legislature did here was to effectively declare her husband legally dead uh, in such a way that she was a widow by law and thus entitled to her rights as such. Right? Significantly too, and this is important, the assembly used Free Love's case as a new precedent. The body became, quote, empowered to settle with any of the absentee wives remaining in this state and who have not quitted it to join the enemies of the United States of America. So Free Love Scott here seized an opportunity to better position herself and her children financially, but in the process, her petitioning had the added effect of bending the law for women in certain similar situations. So I think we need to consider the law itself as a less rigid construct, uh, but I'd also like to suggest that we challenge typical understandings of both dependence and power, right? So, Dependence was essentially a fact of life in colonial British America, defining relationships ranging from colonial subjects' connections to the king and wives' unions with their husbands. Both parties in these relationships had power, even dependence, and these relationships required a set of mutual obligations. Thus, dependence was not an inherently impotent status. Other scholars have studied the ways in which enslavers were dependent upon the people they enslaved. Edmund Morgan's notable American Slavery, American Freedom makes the case that freedom and in, the freedom and independence of the plantation class was inherently contingent upon the unfreedom and dependence of enslaved people. Notably, both women and men exercised this coercive power over enslaved people and were dependent upon them, right? Mary Ball Washington, of course, had been an enslaver from the age of three and for the remainder of her life. Eliza Courtright Monroe's father and husband were both enslavers as well, right? So this position of dependence in, in uh, 18th century society is very complicated. Um, the meaning of dependence really shifted with the adoption of the Declaration of independence, right? Dependence ceased to be a construct with positive connotations in the American imagination and likewise became imbued with a sense of powerlessness. The newly independent United States required the allegiance of its people and adopted the concept of voluntary citizenship rather than involuntary subjectship. Accordingly, the law recognized women's personhood and to a certain degree their citizenship, uh, but it also presumed their dependence, which codified them as legally vulnerable and passive. Dependence then became highly gendered and feminized. Women's dependent status was likewise contingent on their socioeconomic status, their race, the legal jurisdiction in which they resided, and their relationship to men in power. Importantly, this is my excellent graphic design background, right? Uh, dependence must not be observed as the ultimate foil to independence. These terms are not abjectly dichotomous to one another, but exist on a fluid spectrum. Spectrum, yeah. Uh, this spectrum of dependence was deeply hierarchical. So let me provide another example, one of my favorites. On January 19th, 1779, uh, a free black man named Carolina Lamble uh, attested to his purchase and subsequent manumission of an enslaved woman named Jane. Most manumission deeds were submitted to the state by very uh, wealthy white Americans who had the economic power to claim ownership over other human beings. So Lamble's race already stands out from the rest of the source base. He testified that the amount Jane paid him for her freedom was a mere 20 shillings. Such a, a sum seems puzzling when juxtaposed with hundreds of deeds in which enslaved people were often sold for hundreds or even thousands of pounds. Lamble, however, was not concerned with Jane's monetary value as human property. Instead, he offered as motivation for his manumission the love and affection he possessed for Jane as her husband. Lamble purchased his wife from an enslaver named Rachel Caw and used his power as a free man to liberate his wife from the institution of slavery. Because I've been focusing on the importance of the rhetoric in these legal documents, I'll highlight one phrase that I think is especially notable within Jane Lamble's emancipation deed. 
With the stroke of a pen, uh, he, as he made his mark, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna make sure I'm on the right slide. With the stroke of a pen, as he made his mark on this binding legal document, Carolina Lamble declared that his wife, Jane, should henceforth be legally entitled to have and to hold herself, right? Lamble's diction here is significant. Rather than present the South Carolina Secretary of State with the same rote language employed by the white men and women whose business it was to trade in human beings, Lamble and Jane chose their own words. As a result of their marital union of their love, Jane would have ownership over herself. Jane and Carolina Lamble's future children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and all generations that followed would enjoy the same, all descending from a free female line. At the same time, however, the patriarchal state dictated the process by which Lamble and Jane would work together to seize her freedom and that of their future children. Seeking to legitimate Jane's freedom under the law, Lamble purchased his wife and therefore, albeit briefly, owned her. In those moments, Jane was legally enslaved property belonging to her own husband. And it was this intermediary point between slavery and freedom, right, a very brief moment on this spectrum, that the two facilitated together. It was a temporary, a means, it was temporary, a means to an end, a technicality of sorts. It was a necessary step to ensure Jane's freedom in the eyes of the patriarchal state and in accordance with the law. Black women's relationship to freedom, independence, and the patriarchal state was inherently fraught with contradictions. You may have noticed too that I did not mention Jane or Carolina Lamble's petition for the former's freedom. Instead, I referred to a deed of manumission, a legal document required by the state of South Carolina to recognize officially the freedom of African Americans. Petitions submitted to state legislatures and courts by black women across the period were very few and far between. But in the same way that I'm asking you to reconsider our understandings of dependence and power, I'd like us and uh, scholars as well, to broaden our understanding of petitions and the petitioning process. In order to truly analyze how black women navigated the confining socio-legal systems created by the patriarchal state, we must likewise look beyond the traditional legal archive and consider the voices and actions of black women in both slavery's archive and freedom's archive. In the lives of enslaved women, for example, the patriarchal state was personified in the figure of the enslaving patriarch to whom the institutional state granted and extended its powers. Deeds of emancipation, which are often written by enslavers, can uncover the otherwise invisible anti-slavery activism of those people, including women who were held in bondage. Right, so legal sources like deeds of emancipation can provide us with evidence of black women's petitioning efforts. These important sources reveal that gendered familial roles circumscri circumscribe the ways in which black women navigated their legal status in the revolutionary era. As was the case with Carolina Lamble and his wife Jane, black men and women often worked together in their quest for freedom. Black husbands and fathers perform the role of protector and provider for their wives and children in exceptional ways, especially relative to white husbands and fathers. Likewise, black women fulfilled wifely and motherly duties in their interactions with the patriarchal state, despite the legal, economic, and social limitations imposed on them by their racial identity and status of enslavement. Most significantly, black women's capacity to grant freedom or unfreedom to their children was literally embodied within them. The laws of colonial Virginia very famously outlined this most explicitly in 1662, eschewing the Anglo-American concepts of patriarchal lineage and instead establishing that an enslaved mother's status determined the status of her children. This is known as the doctrine of partus sequitur ventrum. Right? And because of this legal uh, custom, a child's legal status of freedom or slavery would follow that of their mother at birth as opposed to their father. Right? And numerous scholars have analyzed the ways in which black women's reproductive capacity bolstered the white patriarchal state here by facilitating the natural increase of the enslaved population, both institutionally and literally, as numerous enslavers assaulted enslaved women and subsequently held their own biological children in slavery. Mary Ball Washington biographer and historian Martha Saxton argued that, quote, this all but destroyed the possibilities for enslaved families to protect themselves and expanded extraordinarily the reach and muscle of these burgeoning Virginia dynasties. <laughs> 
Certainly this was the case under most circumstances, but the doctrine of partis sequitur ventrum requires a more nuanced analysis, I think. Um, by the same framework of law, black women's bodies could also grant freedom to their children and importantly to subsequent generations of free black Americans. So here are the stakes of black women's efforts in testing and exploiting the boundaries of patriarchal power were much higher than those for white women. The latter petitioned the state in the revolutionary era for relief and assistance because of the upheavals of war and daily life, which I'm certainly not going to diminish in any capacity, right? Certainly they're doing this as a matter of survival in many cases. But regardless of the intent or need of these white women petitioners, these rhetorical strategies reinforced white patriarchs' expectations of dependent women's behavior and attitudes. Free and enslaved black women, on the other hand, resisted the patriarchal state in a more explicit way, seeking to free themselves and their progeny from enslavement forever, performing the utmost measure of devoted motherhood. Yet notably, they too conformed to the terms of the patriarchal law to codify that freedom out of extreme necessity. In numerous ways, the patriarchal state in its various forms did not live up to the protections it promised its dependents. I know that's probably shocking to hear, right? In these cases, women often took matters into their own hands, relying on each other and compelling the state's compliance through the collective support of women's networks. So I'd like to argue also, sorry, I forgot to give you that one, uh, that women's interdependence, their reliance on one another was a critical component of their ability to survive in the revolutionary era, despite the patriarchal state's legal, economic, and social restrictions that was meant to inhibit their power and agency. Women built, sustained, and depended upon female networks of interdependence when their mechanisms of protection within the patriarchal state failed them. Women relied on female family members and friends across North America and throughout the Atlantic world, but also in their neighborhoods, often bypassing or explicitly challenging male authority in the process. Women's communal and familial networks enabled them to critique men and the patriarchal state in an effort to protect the women in their lives, in some ways usurping the role of the male protector and expressly undermining women's dependence. The historical record is replete with examples of the ways in which women came to each other's aid and defense, especially when patriarchal figures, their spouses, or the state failed to uh, provide adequate support or protection for these women. And I have oodles of stories if anybody wants to ask about them in the Q&A period. <laughs> I want to stick to time here, so I'm going to punch that to, to later. Um, they shared rhetorical strategies in writing petitions. In some cases, they petitioned the state together or wrote petitions on behalf of their female friends or family members. Most notably, I think, evidence in depositions from divorce suits indicate that women more readily provided witness testimony in support of other women than did men. In a number of cases, too, women physically intervened to protect their neighbors and family, female family members from domestic violence, saving their lives in the process, right? And notably, these dep depositions reveal men's reluctance to step between a husband and a wife in these instances as well. This interdependence proved a critical failsafe when the patriarchal state and household patriarchs proved inadequate protectors and providers. In the places I study, these densely populated urban areas, the proximity of female friends and neighbors provided women with local networks that supported and in some cases uh, saved them. In rural Virginia, where Mary Ball Washington spent most of her life, forceful patriarchal authority reigned without the interference of neighborly women who lived well out of earshot and too far to provide that same strong network, right? So regional um, uh, position is really important there as well. Like dependence and independence, I think we also need to think about power and expressions of power as existing on a spectrum. While a traditional understanding of power employ, implies some form of domination of one party over another through possession, control, command, or authority, this conception obscures the meaning of the word itself while also negating the exercises and expressions of power that do not conform to these standards. So if power is understood as existing on a fluid spectrum, an analysis of women's invocation of the language of dependence in their petitions, right, becomes much different. 
The notion that women could and can still express power because of their subordinate status and the protection it offers indicates that women have never been completely powerless. Right? Um, I'd like to borrow uh, from a feminist philosopher's uh, conception of the powers of the weak. Um, like other historically marginalized groups or individuals, women have been able to express a degree of power, autonomy, and agency over their own lives while still being overtly uh, oppressed by a controlling authority. Thus, dependents express power in a variety of ways, including more subtle means, such as claiming a public voice or becoming politically active through the submission of petitions. What is especially significant, however, uh, uh, lost my spot again, is not that women found power through petitioning various authorities, but that they found power in this way through public declarations of their dependent, unequal, and subordinate status. Now, while this strategy was certainly effective in remedying women's individual problems in that moment, it may have simultaneously delayed and restricted women's ability to collectively organize and push for the rights and freedoms that eluded them during and in the wake of the American Revolution. Ironically, when women engaged with, employed, and exploited the terms of their dependence as a strategy for survival, advancement, and empowerment, the unintended result of that method was to perpetuate their inequality. Without collective action with only short-term resistance to individual abuses in particular situations for specific women, the system of oppression, the white patriarchal power structure, flourished. Patriarchy thrives when the problem identified, as was the case in revolutionary era women's petitions, is individual men who do not conform to the system. When women identified singular abusive husbands, negligent providers, or derelict male leaders as the obstacle to their safety and survival, these men appeared as aberrant cogs in an otherwise functional machine. The real problem, however, was a hierarchical structure crafted according to deficient and erroneous presumptions that could only ever truly protect those already in power. Guaranteed protection for dependence was and is merely a veneer to hide the failures of a flawed system that can never live up to its promises. Most women in the revolutionary era did not have the time, the capacity, or inclination to pursue collective action to fight against the oppressive forces of the patriarchal state. Their tacit acceptance of their own unequal status was motivated by the need to survive in most cases, the urgency of managing the consequences of men's choices in war, in politics, under the law, among other things. In this system, they did not or could not prioritize countering the suppression of their sex by men, instead pursuing the more feasible goal of expressing agency and power over their own individual lives. So this all underscores the need to redefine and thus in the process uh, reclaim women's power throughout history. We have to conduct our historical analysis based on what was possible uh, and not project our 21st century expectations on those who lived in a patriarchal society exponentially more confining and limiting than their own, something I have to remind my students of on a daily basis. Right? Take, for example, the case of women's rights. Uh, no, the American Revolution and the founding of a new nation purportedly on the basis of equality for all did not bring these ideals to fruition. Women did not, for example, claim the legal right to suffrage until at least 1920 and for many marginalized women long after that. But that does not mean that there, were not, there was not a shift in women's rights during the revolutionary era. What I think was the most notable trend that I discovered in my research was that women in petitioning the government began to demand aid and assistance from the state as a right beginning in the early to mid 1770s, using that language of rights specifically, right? I can literally trace the first petition in 1772 where I start to see that language. This right existed on the basis of their dependence on men. The revolution did not grant them this additional right. It already existed. It had for generations. Yet what is critical was that ordinary women would start to recognize themselves as rights-bearing individuals. This was a necessary step in raising their consciousness as citizens, ultimately and eventually believing that they deserve full equality under the law. So even for those women who sought to remedy only the injustices of their own statuses, their individual persistence created significant cracks in the foundation of the patriarchal system. 
Power is not always a matter of tearing down walls and breaking through barriers. It's not always loud or visible or paradigm shifting. It's often slight and subtle and quiet or silent, careful not to disturb the vast machinations of subjugation against which it resists in order to make small but meaningful gains and in some cases, assenting to components of that subjugation as a means to an end. Power in many cases is evidenced by that persistence amid a deep and structural disadvantage built into systemic discri discrimination and oppression. And it is that persistence which is the through line among all instances for the fight for rights, freedom, and independence in American history. Thank you. So um, hello, everyone. I'm Lindsay, the Public Organs Coordinator at the James Monroe Museum. You talk to me usually behind the scenes, so it's great to see your faces in person. Um, I'm here to take any questions you may have from the virtual audience or in person. I have, I've been watching online with you all this whole time. Um, so if, does anyone have a question? Oh, we got it through. OK. We'll start with you, and then you can just bump along. So um, in the manumission document um, of Jane, mm -hmm. Um, where um, her husband indicated um, that she would be um, for herself. Mm -hmm. Having to hold her. How, how was that meant to work within the, the white, the greater society of dependence of women to men? I mean, they were still husband and wife. Yes, they were. Um, what's difficult to assess here, again, because I don't have um, you know private documents of theirs to read, I can only insinuate what their relationship was like based on this one legal document, um, but the expectations of man and wife that I kind of had at the beginning were generally perceived to be expectations of white marriages, right? Um, Tara Hunter, who's a historian at Princeton, I believe, has spoken or has written a lot more in depth on this, so uh, she has an entire book about enslaved and free black marriages, um, but the kind of social and cultural expectations are a little bit different, right? Um, white men and women would not have conceptualized black marriages as being equal to their own. And you know, enslaved marriages, of course, were not recognized under law. So there is a kind of hierarchy there as well. Um, but certainly, there was a kind of expectation of black women's dependence on black men within marriage, um, but not as, um, again, it was a kind of um, not as codified an expectation in, in the literature of the time. You had offered to share some anecdotes of the uh, interdependence between yeah. women. I would love to hear it. Yeah, so these are some of my, I think that chapter is my favorite chapter because it's, you know, women helping women, it's great. Um, but I also sometimes feel like the Jerry Springer of the 18th century because people just aired their dirty laundry in these divorce depositions. It's pretty wild. Um, so there are um, a lot of instances where women are acting as witnesses in these depositions, and it's one of the few kind of instances where they actually have power and legitimacy in the courts, right, over women's matters, right, them and, and midwives usually. So their voices are taken seriously as an authority on these matters. Um, but there's a lot, again, in these cities where people are living close by, um, the walls are pretty thin uh, between these townhouses, so people can kind of hear what's going on. Women know whether their neighbors are victims of abuse on a regular basis. They also talk to each other, right? So they have that history. Um, but there's one particularly vivid example where um, two women are in a house, they're chatting, and they hear some commotion in the neighbor's house next door, and they think something's going wrong, someone's being hurt, so they kind of rush out and kind of bust through the door there. And no one's being hurt uh, in this case, but they're witnessing an act of adultery uh, in front of them, right? This man is with someone who is not his wife. Um, and this is all in the legal documents. I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my goodness, right? Um, and they basically say, you know, what are you doing? She's not your wife. And he says, literally, one woman is as good to me as another. And like, in front of these women, and then they say, and he stood up and he was naked, and you know, they're saying this in the court. It's a huge deal. So, you know, that helps, that helps women get divorces when people are willing to testify as such. On the darker end of that spectrum, there are, as I alluded to, plenty of examples where women um, 
testify to, you know, half a dozen times I've had to step between him and her when he has like something in his head. Like usually it's like a fireplace poker or something, right? Really awful stuff. Um, but what's, what's really fascinating, and fascinating is maybe not the right word, but um, revelatory uh, is when, um, you know, male and female uh, partners, right? The husband and wife are testifying together, right? Different um, perspectives where the woman is consistently saying, yes, I step between them on a regular basis, and the husband is like, I don't really know if that was happening, when like, he knows full well what's going on. Right? So there's evidence that that gender solidarity works both ways, right? that men are unwilling to challenge their neighbor's patriarchal authority, where women are like, you know, I, have, I have to help her both in court and in real life. And that's just the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Um. Sure. The covered or dependent status of women continued, I think, long after the revolutionary era. Where would you start to find that ending? Uh, <laughs> um, well, throughout the 19th century, um, divorce was liberalized in a lot of states, right? Especially as some of these Western territories are becoming states, it's more common. Um, there are also, in the middle to late 19th century, what are called Married Women's Property Acts, which starts to grant property rights to women who are still married. Um, but what, it wasn't until the 1970s when married women could have credit cards in their own name? So like, it really depends on how you're defining the scope of so coverture. 23rd century. Right, so I mean, it, that's why I'm like, well, I don't know. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of when it's not just legal, but social and cultural understandings of women's dependence. Are we really out of it? I don't know. So it's, it's, it's complicated and messy, but you start to see um, at least different laws are chipping away at it, um, but mostly at the state level. I think even South Carolina didn't make no-fault divorce legal until certainly the second half of the 20th century. I just forget when, but I don't know. Is it still? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions? OK, let me check online. Okay, well, we will be doing a book signing. We do have books for sale today. Um, if you're interested, they're already signed, but you could also get them personalized with the author here. Just saying. <laughs> um, thank you all for, so much for coming tonight. Um, we hope to see you for future events. Like I said, founding uh, friendships will be on April 4th at 6.30, oh, sorry, 6 p.m. at Central R Rappahannock Library. And then Mary Washington House, do you have any final things? April, April 9th, we're going to be having a tour on La, Marquis de Lafayette and his relationship with the Washington family, viewing it through the prism of his relationship with Mary. He was very good friends with Mary Washington also. So give us a round of applause for our lovely speaker tonight.